Proverbs 21. And tonight we're going to focus in on verse 10, which says, The soul of the wicked desireth evil, his neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. So to begin with, let's think about this word soul. It's from the Hebrew nephesh. And it speaks of of really the very life of a person, and it's sometimes translated as life. It's a word that is used to denote breathing, and so it it often carries the idea of all the experience that goes with a person's life, their life experience as a breathing being. Um, We would nowadays, when we're talking about something like this, we might say heart instead of soul, because that's just kind of our vernacular. Um, The word wicked is um, the Hebrew word for ungodly. Uh, The word translated evil is the generic Hebrew word for anything that is bad. Whatever is contrary to the will of God falls under that word. So we can kind of understand that this whole thing to say this, that the very heart of the ungodly person desires the things God calls evil. Um, now, having just covered the, the worldwide flood of Noah's day, um, this comes to mind immediately. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I said, I've never seen a more emphatic statement than, than that one. And uh, obviously, it doesn't say anything good about what the state of the world was. Mankind did not have room for God. So instead, mankind consistently longed for or even created the kinds of things that God condemned. Now, thinking about that, Jesus, in reference to his second coming, said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And uh, are we at a point where people generally want the exact opposite of what God has declared good? The answer to that is yes. It's, it's amazingly evident. Uh, we've watched this happen often without even necessarily realizing what was, was happening. Um, our society has a very uh, ungodly focus and this isn't really anything new. I graduated from high school in, in 1981. Um, and two years after that, uh, a magazine called The Humanist published an article in which the writer named John Dumphy wrote this. He said, I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their, I mistyped there, their role as the proselytizers of the new faith, a religion of humanity. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new. The rotting corpse of Christianity together with all its adjacent evils and misery and the new faith of humanism. That's what John Dunphy thought in 1983. Now, the battle had already been waging for years. It was just coming to a point where somebody could be that open about it, and people would go, huh, okay. When I was in high school, games were still on Fridays and Saturdays, ball games. I used to go to football games, not because I even understood football, but our team was so awful, it was funny to go and watch them. Uh, I did, we did have a good basketball team. But the games were always on Fridays or Saturdays, never on Sunday. How did we get to work every school activity is on Sunday? You know how? By Christian parents getting notice that we're going to start doing games on Sunday and saying, well, we don't want Johnny to miss out on football. We'd rather him miss out on church. And somewhere along there, there was enough lack of protest that it's become the norm. But the battle goes way back. In fact, in the early 1800s, most people in the Western world 
understood the various layers of the rocks that can be observed in places like the Grand Canyon as the result of sediment that was laid down after the global flood of Noah's time. But the battle, as I said, has already, had already begun long before that quote I read. In fact, reading a quote from uh, a publication in 1785, a man named James Hutton wrote, The past history of our globe must be explained by what we can see to be happening now. No powers are to be employed that are not natural to the globe, no action to be admitted except those of which we know the principle. In other words, Hutton wanted to exclude the possibility of any large-scale catastrophe such as a biblical flood, and he clearly implies he wants to exclude even the power of God. And this is exactly the kind of sentiment that led a uh, later scientist, C.F. Wiseacre, to observe this. He wrote, it's not by its conclusions, but by its methodological starting point that modern science excludes direct creation. In other words, science consistently chooses to leave God out from the beginning, and that's why God never shows up in the conclusion to their experiments. It's not that they say, well, let's just leave the door open and see what seems most reasonable. They say, no God. And in fact, it's a, fa it's, it's a known fact that in scientific circles, if you want to ruin your career, you just publish a paper that says you believe there might be a creator. That's enough. You will get blacklisted. From the early 1800s onward, it became pretty normal for scientists to reject God's involvement and insist on explaining the past without any mention of God. Without any allowance for a catastrophe like a flood. As I said, we, we can only evaluate the past based on what we see today. And since nobody in this in, in their generation even had seen a worldwide flood, they decided, well, that couldn't have happened. Their decision was not based on any evidence. It was based on just rejecting what God's word said and, and starting over without God. They wanted a way to explain things without the flood and much more importantly to them without any reference to the God who caused the flood to happen as judgment against sin. We need to remember this, that, that whenever you read something about um, a certain thing occurring over millions of years ago, you are reading the theoretical assumptions of those who want to ignore God. And some might say, well, we have scientific methods uh, of proving that the earth is billions of years old. One of their favorite methods is called potassium argon dating. This method is used to determine the age of rock that forms after volcanic activity. You know what? We, we are actually able to witness some of that and do the test. So, <laughs> remember... Saint, Mount St. Saint Helens erupting in 1980 and then again in, in 82. Well, in 1986, they went to the rock that was formed from the volcanic eruption and they did potassium argon dating on it and it was used uh, um, as it was on, uh, you know, on the kind of rock it's supposed to be uh, used for. Um, the rock that was formed following the eruption. And the potassium argon test done in 1986, just four years after the, the, the second eruption, proved that rock that was formed after that eruption was 2.8 million years old. That was 1986. Andrea and I got married in 1986, and it doesn't seem that long ago. Okay. Okay, she says. <laughs> Here's my point. The teachings of evolutionists and their, their millions of years old earth, they're not based on anything that can be proven. 
Nobody has observed anything taking millions of years to form. It's based on theories of how they think it should have happened. And in, in all those, like potassium argon or even um, the uh, uh, well-known carbon-14, they're measured by the something decaying out of it over time. And yet it, it, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, they... Um, one of the tests they did, they, they, they estimate the uh, universe is supposed to be 15 billion years old. Well, based on one of these tests that measures how much of some kind of decay has happened, um, they dated um, part of the Earth as being like three times older than the universe by their reasoning. Yeah, obviously they didn't publish that one. Um, the point I want to make is these kind of dating methods... They don't prove anything. They are just, in fact, I read a, a, I read a, a statement from a scientist who was a believer in Christ, who was a former evolutionist, and he said, you know, I was taught that when you do a, a date, use a dating method like this, that you do three or four tests, he says, and they'll, they'll vary widely by thousands to millions of years. And he said, and I was told, pick the one that backs up your thesis the best. That's not science, but that's what they do. So we need to realize when we hear about, oh, things are billions of years old and da-da-da-da-da, that these are not provable things. And in, their methods are very fallible. And this is the rhetoric of people who don't want God to be there. Now, it's pretty well been uh, uh, established that even with what they want to pretend they think they know about the Earth's original atmosphere, that life couldn't have evolved here. And one scientist said, well, if it didn't evolve here, it must have evolved, evolved elsewhere, and then we were transplanted here. I said, wow, how quickly he moved right into science fiction. Um, but the point of the matter is, Evolution isn't possible. But they say, give it billions of years. What well, you take the impossible and you give it lots of time, and it's still impossible. One scientist who got blacklisted was a man named Michael Behe, and that's how you say his name, B-E-H-E. He's a microbiologist who wrote a book in which he exposed the impossibility of of life coming from non-living matter. He said, when you get a living cell, every bit of every molecule in it is precise in the right number and the right kind. And if you remove any even one element, it's no longer alive. There's no way, he says, it has to start that way. You, you can't become that way if you're not alive. You, it's either alive or it's not. And there's no crossing that. He got blacklisted for that. So, let's get back to some of this. So, um, all of this is part of teaching of what that John Dunphy called the new religion of humanity. Uh, the new religion of godlessness. You, you, you know, the reason evolution hangs on as such a steady teaching is not because it has any real scientific merit, uh, but because people don't want God to be there. And one scientist even made the comment that um, saying that that um, spontaneous um, generation had been proven impossible. He said, but since the only other option is special creation, and we reject that on philosophical grounds, we choose to believe the impossible. In other words, we just don't want God to be there. So, why does man so want God to be out of there? Because lost man is defined by that. The soul of the wicked desireth evil. It is 
the, the sin nature that all human beings have that wants to rebel against God. It is normal for the ungodly person to want what God condemns. And a lot of people think that's a good thing because they say religion is repressive and produces guilt. Have you ever heard that one? Religion is bad because it produces guilt. First, I want to say religion, and particularly Christianity, does not produce guilt. Man produces guilt every time he chooses to do something that's contrary to God's will. That's where the guilt comes from, not from religion, from our actions. Whether you want to admit God's there or not, every time you choose to do something he condemns, you're guilty. You can change the terminology, you can ignore it, but it doesn't make it any different. A man who ignores God's existence is no less guilty than any other. But ignoring God makes him feel like he can do whatever he wants. And that leads to more problems. Let's, let's look at the rest of our, our proverb now. The soul of the wicked desireth, desireth evil, his neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. The word translated favor also means kindness, mercy, and compassion. His neighbor finds no kindness or mercy or compassion in his eyes. So what our, our proverb is saying is nobody is safe when the ungodly person is involved. That ungodly person has no real reason to consistently treat you fairly or compassionately. He has no reason to be truthful unless it serves his personal agenda. By contrast, the Christian has reasons to behave in a better way. Here's some of them. Matthew 5, Jesus talking, says, I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Jesus says, those people you consider your enemies... Treat them with compassion. This is agape, love, love them. You know, if the person who's trying to get you fired at work, if you watch them trip and fall and break their leg and, and smack their head on the concrete, you don't walk by and laugh. You might want to. You may not feel overwhelmed with pity for them, but you treat them with compassion and you get them the help they need because the Lord says so. Now, see, the ungodly person, they have nothing because they're not hearing what the Lord says. So if they want you to lay there and bleed to death, they'll just walk on by and think that's just fine. I'm not saying that all lost people are that cold-hearted. But the point is, love your enemies. That's not normal in the world. But it is commanded by the Lord. Bless them that curse you. Literally, speak well of those who slander you. That's what I want to do, isn't it? When you, when you hear somebody saying something bad about you, don't you want to compliment them? You're really good at being an idiot, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> we can't do that. We have to look and say, I represent Christ. And this is what he tells me to do. I have to speak well of them. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you? Yes. Also another thing Jesus said there, as you would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. That is uh, sometimes paraphrased as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's known as the golden rule to many people. These words were actually on the courthouse in Michigan City, Indiana. Um, I'm, I'm assuming maybe they didn't know where they came from, but uh, they were out on the outside of the building, uh, big and bold. So, um, of course, as those who know what God's will is, this should mean a lot to us. 
You know, nobody in his right mind wants to do damage to himself. Anybody in his right mind, if he were in need of being rescued, would hope somebody would come and rescue him. So when we, we look upon someone else with a need, we have to think, what if I was in their shoes? Why do we do this? Because the Lord says to. So why doesn't the ungodly person do this? Because he's not listening. He has no reason other than whether he felt like it or not. Now, if you take that to its conclusion, the ungodly person has no reason to be honest unless it serves his purpose. And that is why we have so many advertisements that you know are false, but nobody cares. We expect it. When was the last time you got a hamburger that actually looked like the picture? We expect it. To look great in the picture and be smashed and flat and, and cardboard tasting. We expect that. Why? Because we've been lied to so much it's become normal. You know, I was <laughs> watching uh, uh, watch Star Trek with Samuel sometimes, and, and every time we watch it, it's Joe Namath. You know, he's not a quarterback anymore, but he's... He's still he's he's got a sales if he should have been a baseball player sales pitch right, mm -hmm. but uh, um, he says today is one of the few days this year that you can do this. We've seen him saying that for three weeks. <laughs> Who are they fooling? Somebody they hope. You see that they're hoping somebody's going to go. Well, I'm not sure about this, but if it's a limited time offer, I better do it. Some of the things I see advertised, I just, I think some people have had way too much time on their hands since COVID-19 to come up with some of the things. The battery daddy. Yeah, you've seen that one? A box to put your batteries in. I got a better idea. We buy them. They're in boxes. We put them in the drawer, in the box, and they stay organized. But they want you to think you need it. And the truth is, no, I don't. If people were so trustworthy, no one would have to ask somebody that somebody they know and trust, you know a good mechanic? By a good mechanic, we usually mean one who's competent in his job and is trustworthy. Why do we have to ask that? Because we know there's a good number of people, not just mechanics, but a lot of people in other work that they're not really doing their job. The soul of the wicked desireth evil. And his neighbor findeth no favor or mercy or kindness or compassion in his eyes. I, uh, I find myself thinking of a guy I worked with and we were both on, uh, we were both, uh, this sounds so impressive, we were both service specialists for satellite services. It's not like I work for NASA, huh? I was, I was a, a lead housekeeper at a hospital. We used to be called senior housekeepers, but then we got service specialists. And they changed the name of our department for a while because we only took care of non-patient areas. Um, so what does it mean that I was a service specialist for, for satellite services? It means I'm the guy that taught the others to clean toilets. Um, and me and this one other guy, we knew each other uh, you know, for a couple of years and uh, actually, he just lived around the block. I went for walks. I'd run into him. And they started talking about creating another position one step up from the two of us. Suddenly, he was the nastiest person I ever met. And he made an absolute fool out of himself in a meeting trying to accuse me of things and opening the door for it all to backfire on him and reveal that he'd had keys relocked so that I couldn't do part of my job, something my direct supervisor had been made privy to. And after it was all over and they decided, oh, by the way, we're not inventing, we're not creating that position, he was my buddy again. Uh, I'll tell you what, if he needed my help, I would have helped him, but I wasn't eager to trust him. We 
need to be wise enough, first of all, to realize the world is full of people that don't have any external motivation to be honest. We have external motivation in the words of God, in the words of our Lord. We know what to do because we admit that God is there and we know him and we know we are supposed to honor him. So when he says, do this, we should do it. It's not always easy. It's not always in line with what our fleshly impulse may be. But we know we should do it because God says so. We need to be aware there are a lot of people in the world that don't share our view of the truth. They don't know the truth. They don't want to. But we need to remember we are called to a higher standard. There's one thing I think Satan does over and over again is he tries to get God's people to come down a notch. You know, you got that person that's always picking on you and they're always calling you bad names. You turn around and you get ugly with them. And everybody goes, whoa, and you've, you, you've made an impression. What you don't know is somebody out there is going, I thought he was a Christian. Maybe somebody's saying, I, I, I used to look up to him. We are called to a higher standard, and it really doesn't matter what the world thinks of us. I have a lot of old ex-friends because they don't want anything to do with me. And I think those of you who know me well enough know I don't go around looking for a fight. I don't look to attack people. I try to treat people with compassion. I try to use words in a diplomatic way so as not to provoke anyone. But there are some people who can't stand me anymore because I am a Bible-believing Christian. That's all that matters. I've shared with you the one that said, if your God doesn't approve of what I want to do, then I don't approve of your God. It doesn't matter whether you approve of him or not. You better start thinking about whether he approves of you or not. Because he's still God. Maybe if we are living by God's standards, even though sometimes that's hard, sometimes we will get the pressure put on us to conform and act like the world, but we have a higher standard we are called to. And if we are living by it, there are times that people will go, how do you put up with that? I say, well, I don't enjoy it, but it would be wrong for me to look to get revenge. Why? Well, because the Lord says that would be wrong. And I believe him. Um, just letting somebody know you're a believer and then striving to live consistently with that will make a difference. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, too, is there's always somebody who's looking for Christians to make a mistake. And if you're looking for someone to make a mistake, you won't be disappointed because we all do that. But at the same time, if you're trying to be consistent with what you believe and honor God, then people are going to know who to turn to if they need somebody to trust. I told you I had the one uh, worker who his friends were afraid was going to go home and hurt himself after he got some particular news, and he came to me and, and asked to go home. And I said, your friends have already been in here, and they're worried about you. I said, and, and I know you've got something going on in your personal life. I said, you, you want to talk about it? He said, you know, Robert, he says, uh, I know you're a minister, and, and I've, I've thought about talking to you. He said, but you're also my boss. He says, and I, I kind of have a history of having a little problem with authority. So I took up my name tag, it was a clip on my collar. I took it off, and I threw it on the floor. I said, we're just a couple of guys. And we talked for an hour, and we prayed together. And he took my counsel. I shared the gospel with him. He took my counsel, acted on it, and uh, his life turned around. Why did, why did he feel like he could talk to me and trust me? 
because he knew where I stood, he knew what I believed, and he had known me long enough and watched me long enough to know that I made an effort to live according to what I believed. That, that left an impression on me. An impression that simply this, that God can use us if we're available. Tell you what, on that job, there were several times that my fleshly nature wanted to lose it with people. And I had, you know, I had people sleeping on the job. I had all kinds of things I had to deal with. Uh, one guy who was uh, got drunk and went crazy on the job. And then I think the best thing for everybody is he decided to leave all on his own before the shift was over. But with God's help, I tried to be consistent. And I'm not saying that I did an excellent job of that, but I'm saying God knew that I wanted to honor him, and God was able to use me. And he's able to use every one of us. And you may not even know how. You know, I graduated high school. I was, um, well, I was a fool when I graduated high school because I, I was an atheist, and, and the Bible says the fool said in his heart, there's no God. So I was a fool. And yet, you know, for some time after that, I kept thinking of certain Christian people I knew who treated me in a way that was consistent with the faith they proclaimed, and they left an impact on me. They left a mark on me that I couldn't shake off, even though I kind of wanted to, because I didn't want to believe at the time. But I'm glad they made that mark on me now. And some of those are, are my friends on Facebook now, years later. I'd lost track of. And I'm glad God used them. What did he use them? He just used them to show me what a true believer could act like. So regardless of what's going on in the world, regardless of the fact, well... <laughs> That that's what much of the world is like. We have not only a higher standard, but a better standard. If everybody in the world acts like that, with no concern for anyone else, and a desire just to do things that are contrary to God, um, the world will become even more of what it is. Now, on the other hand, what if everybody acted according to God's standards? That'd be as close as you could get to heaven on earth. It's not going to happen on this earth. But we look for a new heavens and a new earth, according to what Peter wrote, wherein, he says, dwelleth righteousness. I can't wait to see that one. And, you know, I, I've said many times, I can't imagine what a world that has only righteousness is going to be like, because I've never seen one. But God says it's going to be just that. And... As believers in Jesus Christ, we are promised a place there. So when you look at this world, you look at the people who are doing the wrong things, you look at even people that will cheat you sometimes, and remember, this is just temporary. By If we live according to what the Lord says, we will have better lives, mainly because we'll have a clean conscience before Him. And... We have a promise of something so much better than this world with all of its wickedness and crookedness. We have eternity with our Savior. And that's all I have for tonight.